Okay. So what is Rebuild the Temple? Well, it is a four-part series that I've done over the years to help people better game plan and also uh, live consciously around their health um, as, as they age. So in this particular class, this is more of a foundations class. You know, you don't, if we don't hit our belief structures properly, then, you know, we can really miss out on the actions that may be necessary to uh, achieve a high level of health, not only now, but into the future and to raise healthy kids. So one thing that I want to really focus on here in this class and in the, in the homework that you're going to have with you in this class is going to be this beliefs triangle. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a, is a cycle that happens around basically everything that you do in your life. You know, it starts with a belief. Uh, a belief will drive a behavior, and then that behavior will then get us a specific result. So a lot of times if we're having a result, let's just say um, an ongoing health challenge, we'll talk like in terms of, of children, for instance, let's just say that we have a child who is having uh, re reoccurring ear infections, for example. So the result that this child is experiencing down here is a reoccurring ear infection. So then we have to backtrack. We got to look at the behaviors that have maybe led up to that result. So this, you know, there's a, there's a lot of them, trust me. Uh, but a common behavior when a child has ear infections is to go to the pediatrician and get antibiotics. That happens uh, almost every time, if not every time a child that I, at least I take care of that end up in the, in the, in a pediatric, uh, office would get a diet would get diagnosed with ear infections and then get antibiotics for that so the given the child the antibiotics would maybe be one of the behaviors um, also all of their basically lifestyle patterns would also be considered a behavior but let's just say that the belief here is that this ear infection is caused by a, by a uh, by a bacterial infection in the in the inner ear if that's the case, then the behavior that, that follows that belief system would be to get an antibiotic because what do antibiotics do? They kill bacteria. So then the result down there would be no more ear infections. But what we find is in the vast majority of ear infections, especially when antibiotics are involved, is that they tend to be reoccurring and they keep coming back. So we've had kids in our office that have come in that have had, say, 12, 13, 14 rounds of antibiotics for ear infections in the same year, okay? So at that point, we got to look at this result and say, we're still having ear infections. Uh, the antibiotics are not doing the job. So let's backtrack that to the belief structure is maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's not anything to do with bacteria, right? So we have to bring consciousness around this stuff when it comes to our, our health, okay? So let's pop back here for a second. Uh, a thought that I do wanna start off with here, because you know, being, a, being a chiropractor, you know, a lot of the adults that we see typically will come in with, uh, with some sort of a pain point that drives them into the office, you know, unless they have um, encountered us at workshops where we're talking more about you know, the neurology and specifically what we do in our office. But the vast majority of chiropractic patients are going in with some sort of a pain point. Um, and here's the thing that, See, where's my note here? I took a lot of notes for this, so bear with me here. So the one point that I want to, to bring up is that things happen. Things happen to us, okay? Um, when, I look at, when I look at health and longevity, I look at strength and adaptability. I believe that a human being has to be strong enough and resilient enough to adapt to all the stressors that we put in front of us in our lives. So 
a, a point that I want to make here is, especially if you are, have like an injury or you're treating the same uh, issue over and over again, is, is that our health, our level of health, our level of function, it never remains the same. We're in constant motion with the varying degrees of health in terms of, um, uh, let's say, like, like breakdown and buildup of healthy tissues, for example. And our health state never stays the same. In fact, when, if you have like an injury, for instance, you know, there's going to be some neural pathways that get laid down, depending on how long that injury is festering, how long those pain patterns are firing. And, and we can see that the, the, the brain will actually lay down more neurology to allow you to experience more of that pain. Okay. I know it sounds crazy, but the, there's, there's patterns, patterns to this. And, and the point that I'm trying to make here is that you can never get back to where you were. Okay. Uh, we have set goals with folks when they come into our office. And a lot of times, some of those goals will be like, I want to get to where I was before the injury. And the reality of it is, is that you can't go back in time. Okay. The body's constantly adapting. It's constantly changing. And it, and, and it's, we're constantly building a body that's fit for what we're doing currently. Um, I hope, I hope that makes sense to you, but in a sense, Either the actions that we take today are going to make us stronger and more resilient, or the actions that we take, or even if it's been an injury, um, it's, it can make us weaker, more vulnerable, and sicker. Okay, so keep that in mind as we move forward. But let's talk a little bit about beliefs and results and all that good stuff. So right now, if we look at our general population, um, the the status quo, if you will, in the United States, this is the results that we're dealing with here. This is the state of our nation. Uh, I got all these stats off the CDC and NIH websites, uh, but our obesity rate in the United States is 42%. We have 37 million Americans have diabetes, 20 million are diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, and we have 631,000 deaths from heart disease, um, there's 1.7 million, that's a funny spelling, a million new cancer cases uh, every year. That's, that's new cancer cases every year, and almost 600,000 people die every year of cancer. Now, both of these rates are on the rise. 66% uh, of Americans take prescription drugs weekly. 66% are taking drugs. 13% take antidepressants. When we look at women over 60, that number jumps up to, let's see, I got it right here, 25%, 24.3% of women over the age of 60 are taking antidepressants. Americans, as you know, we consume over 50% of all the drugs on the planet, and we make up less than 5%. You know, we spend more money on healthcare. We're spending tw over 12,000 per person, which equals $11 billion a day, $4.1 trillion a year on quote unquote healthcare. So what's that get us? That gets us uh, ranked at a whopping 37th as the healthiest nations. We're ranked 37th in overall health markers um, globally. So uh, when we look at results here, I don't know what you guys think about that, but um, those results are not very good. Okay, so then we got track down. Okay, behaviors. We know we know that uh, people just aren't moving a lot. You know, there's there's uh, there's a lot of physical inactivity. Um, our diet patterns are off of a uh, normal healthy, right? So we're going to talk about this when we get into the stressors on our later workshops. We have our eat well, move well, think well workshop uh, that are coming down the pipeline ahead of us to try to get around, get around what the heck we're seeing happen, right? Um, and, you know, 2020 with COVID really shed light on this because what we found out about this nasty virus uh, is that healthy individuals made out better, okay? Healthy individuals made out a lot better than unhealthy individuals. So um, 
you know, it was a nasty deal. Um, I mean, me, I, I, I believe I had, I had COVID and, and it completely nuked my sense of smell. Uh, so, you know, that hasn't restored. It's been darn near two years. So, I mean, things happen, you know, if you walk outside right now and you slip on the sidewalk and you fall just wrong, you know, you could create damage somewhere in your body that will be with you for the rest of your life. Okay. So things happen. Um, but we need to try to do everything we can to prepare for those things to happen. But where do you think these beliefs come from? Where would the beliefs come from that allow us to experience this level of health that we're seeing with the state of the nation? Well, where they come from really is mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers, friends, social media, TV, movies, advertisements, governments. Now I'm going to put a big emphasis and a big bit of blame when we look at this page here, I want to put a big bit of blame really on, on media for the most part, um, media, governments, movies, advertisements. And I'll show you how this is all, um, this has all been detrimental to the health of humans. Um, when we look at advertisements from, you know, big food, big pharma, uh, and, and the collusion between big food, big pharma, the FDA, uh, we can track that down. I got demographic obesity charts that range from 1985 all the way through uh, 2000. I think I got it up to 2013. But in those charts, we also incorporated some of the guidelines that the FDA put out there for dietary guidelines for food groups, uh, food pyramids, things like that. And you can see what happens to the obesity rankings. Um, as as we followed those recommendations. So that's all going to be dove into deeper in the next one. But it doesn't matter where they came from. But what we need to do is we need to, to be more conscious about the way that we think about our health. Okay. The reality of it is that a lot of people, you know, just say like overweight, for instance, I just threw this in there as a, for instance, overweight population, because it's easy to kind of track down a belief where you have, let's see if I got my here, we'll go back to this one. So we have a major obesity issue. We look at back in 1990, there was zero states in the union that were reported to be over 20% obese. Uh, and a, a big, uh, a big common um, blame for obesity is, you know, genetics. You know, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's just how I'm going to be. It's genetics. You know, so that would be a belief. So if your belief is that genetics are to blame, then you're going to act differently and you're going to get a different results. Um, and then the result that you get is going to reinforce that belief. See, I told you, I can't lose weight. You go on a diet. Let's say, you know, you, you try it, you try a diet, you try to change behavior without changing this belief. Your belief is your belief is, um, I'm obese because I just got bad genes. Um, it doesn't matter what I do. I've tried dieting, right? So I've tried behavior modification. I've gone weeks and, you know, usually weeks, sometimes months on a strict diet. And maybe you will see some good changes um, early on, but they're slow and you get frustrated and you slip off of that diet. And then you step on the scale and you see that your results are similar. And then you reinforce that belief that, see, I just must have bad genes. Okay. Now, when it comes to genetics, I believe that there is some genetical component in terms of metabolism and body types. I believe that there's the, uh, there's there's three main body types or three main um, uh, metabolisms that have been classified that you can study in on. Um, I'm not going to dive into them here, but one of them is people that just constantly burn fat, like high, like high blast furnace metabolisms, right? These are the people that no matter how much they eat, they can't put on, they will not put on weight. Um, and then you have people who are more slower metabolisms that store fat. Now, uh, 10,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago, those individuals that were able to store fat and slow their metabolism down, they probably lived longer. And the reason they lived longer is because food wasn't so abundant. 
right? So not one of these metabolisms is necessarily good or bad, but it can play into the, the result that you're seeing in the reinforcements of your current beliefs. But let's go back to this. We talk about the fat gene. So if you know anything about genetics, you know that they just don't change this stinking fast. In 1990, we had zero states above 20% obesity. In 2000, we had 22 states that had their population above 20% obesity. And in 2005, only four states were less than 20% and 17 of them were above 30%. This is not a genetic issue. Now, when we look at this from the Journal of Physiology, approximately 250,000 deaths per year are, are premature due to physical inactivity alone. So uh, inactivity increases the, the chances of chronic disease um, in a lot of them. And here's another one, uh, another study from the Journal of Circulation 2008 where the, the, present obesity, uh, the present obesity epidemic is both troubling and informative because adiposity is largely caused by poor diet, which is an excess calories. You take in more calories than you put out and this uh, emphasize. And then when we put our emphasis on the result, right? When we're focusing on the results such as hypertension, um, high triglycerides, um, high cholesterol, and, you know, just all these cardiovascular consequences and diabetes that comes downstream of this adiposity, uh, what we find is that when you focus downstream, you don't ever get to the root of the problem. That is how every year, that is how every year we see these numbers go up. And every year we're consuming more drugs to try to manage the symptoms, to try to manage the degenerative disease processes that are really caused by lifestyle. Um, and there's a lot of evidence out there that supports exactly what I had just stated. Now, this is what they confirmed in that journal article is that the, the genetic effects are subordinate to lifestyle and in, in environmental influences. So I, I, I was blessed to go to school with a fantastic uh, chiropractor uh, who grew up in the genetic field. And uh, you know, he's the one that introduced me to the concept of epigenetics. And epigenetics is simply means that, you know, your genetics would be like, would be like a library, a library filled with recipes. And depending on which environmental stressors we're trying to adapt to, those are the recipes that get pulled. Those are the genetic expressions that get experienced. So what that means simply is lifestyle and environment are above, are more important than genetics. Okay. You can have that body type that is the fat storage body type, but if you understand that and you know how to manage that, you can still have a, a healthy body composition and um, a healthy uh, body itself, healthy, resilient, strong. You can have all of that. So the cost. Okay. First of all, there's a dollar amount on this for sure. You know, what we say it was overall in healthcare, we're spending 11, over $11 billion a day. Okay. Now, I don't know, but I think like right now we're kind of in a financial crunch as a country. We're going bankrupt and, and, and I'm hearing of uh, states like, you know, out West, for instance, you know, uh, the state of Washington, I believe, or, or maybe it's um, Oregon, one of those two states. They are passing bills for um, uh, universal health care, Medicare for all, essentially. And you know, I wouldn't be against that. But the problem is, is that we're dumping money into a system that's creating sickness. And it, the reason it's creating more sickness is because it's not addressing the cause of the problems. Right. And it's super expensive. So the dollar amounts that you're seeing on the screen right now that equal $2 trillion a day, these are from diseases, disorders that have been known to be caused by lifestyle. These are 100% lifestyle, well, not 100%, nothing's 100%, but uh, the vast majority of these costs are lifestyle costs. And finding someone else to pay the bill isn't going to solve the problem because in the end, we're all going to have to pay the bill. Now, other than the financial 
uh, problems that come along with sickness. I mean, if we look back to like COVID in 2020 and, and uh, you know, when they were locking down nursing homes, there was, there was a lot of people that, that just weren't able to be around their sick family members when, when, you know, they took their last breath. And to me, that is completely heartbreaking uh, situation. So, um, you know, I do take this stuff seriously uh, and we study it to try to try to help you all not have to live under this current system so we can see that again so it's time to really it's really time to make a change we're even seeing this spill over into our children you know they are watching us they they are establishing belief structures from parents teachers preachers tv media and, and here's where our kids are looking at. We're one in three of them are, are obese. We have glucose intolerance, type two diabetes, which, which, you know, used to be called adult onset diabetes. You know, now we're seeing that in kids, they got liver troubles, gallbladder issues, degenerative issues, um, uh, hormonal issues, uh, self-image issues, developmental disorders, one in 10 asthma, mental illness, one in six. This one surprises me a lot that there's but there's a lot, there's a lot of diagnoses out there. So maybe some of this stuff is, um, you know, I, I'm not sure on the, on the diagnosis of some of this stuff. Some kids are just, you know, wound up because they are, their, their systems are just charged, right. Uh, charged up. We'll, we'll talk about, we've, you know, we, we've got other workshops that really dive into this, but you know, one in five kids have ADHD. I mean, that is staggering. And then when we look at autism, we talk about genetics, right? Is this the genetic issue? In 2000, the autism rates were one in, fit, one in 150. And then in 2022 now, it just got changed to one in 44 kids are getting diagnosed with autism. It is time that we get out and we evaluate our beliefs and we start making changes. Uh, if you don't touch your beliefs, then you can only carry on the behaviors for so long. That is why New Year's resolutions have such a high failure rate. We're trying to change those behaviors without first changing our beliefs. So a big distinction that I wanna make is the difference between sick care and healthcare. Really the United States healthcare system is really a crisis intervention system. And it is a very important service to our culture. We need this stuff. It is life-saving. Medicine and, and healthcare saves lives every day. And, 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 and the way that it does that is that we've been very good at keeping people alive long enough for their bodies to start healing again, because in the end, healing happens on the inside. It's an inside job. Um, but when we look at this and we, we, we enter into a system that's designed to treat sickness, then it doesn't, health is not an outcome of that, okay? Health comes from outside of that system. That system is there to help us get through a challenge, right? So sick care just simply does not make you healthy. An, an example that I have heard or a storyline that I heard for this would be like, picture the medical community as being like the fire department, okay? If your house starts on fire, you have a medical emergency, right? And if your heart house starts on fire, if that fire department gets to your house fast enough, they can put that fire out and save your house. Uh, in the process of doing it, they are going to uh, destroy a lot of things in the house uh, to save the overall house, right? To save your life. Uh, they're going to spray everything down. They come in with their axes and their fire hoses. They're going to, they're going to rip through the walls to make sure that the fire is not spreading internally. And in the end, you're left with a disaster. Now on a preventative end of that, you can absolutely prevent fires by coming around, spraying, having the fire department come to your house and spray it down and soak everything constantly. You will not have to worry about having that fire particularly, but you're going to have other problems with your house. Your house is not going to be in order. Your house is going to be destroyed. We're going to see mold. We're going to see uh, you know, rotten wood. And eventually, we're going to see a collapse caused by the intervention itself. That's what we're seeing. That's what happens in medicine. That's what's happening in our medical community. Uh, 
So we look at, I got another stat here I wanted to share with you that 80% of older Americans who live independently take 20 or, or take 20 or more prescriptions per year. That's yeah, 20, 20 or more prescriptions per year, 80%. Now in nursing home residents, they're taking an average of eight to 10 medications per day. Okay. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, is it keeping them alive? Probably. I mean, they're in a rough shape. We just don't want to get there, right? We need to intervene early on and tr do everything we can to not get in that system. So beliefs really drive the behaviors, like we said. So what I want you to do between this workshop and the next one is really look at the results that you're experiencing. Look at the results that you like um, in your life. Look at the results that you are not happy with in your life and try to determine the, the, the actions that you're taking and the beliefs that, that are going to be there to force that, that action. I'll give you another example of this real quick. Um, we talk a lot about fevers. Um, you know, fevers. I ask people when we do our immune workshops, you know, is fever a good thing or a bad thing? And most of the time, people say it's a good thing. Every now and then we got people that say it's it's a bad thing. And, and, and some people just, they're just not sure. But what do we do? Uh, what do generalize population? What do we do when there's a fever? We're usually taking some kind of a aspirin, Tylenol, some kind of a fever reducer. We want to lower the fever. But if fever is a good thing, why do we want to lower our fever? Because that's going to make everything take longer to get better, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so we got to look at this. I don't know if you guys remember uh, hearing about this or not, but uh, back in the 60s, the Great Lakes were just trashed. They were heavily polluted. Uh, fish were unable to um, reproduce. They were washing up onto the shorelines dead. Uh, the whole ecosystem was destroyed. Birds were, were not able to, um, to uh, reproduce, lay, lay viable eggs. And, and the whole thing was just a mess. Now, what if we went into the Great Lakes with our current healthcare mindset and we decided, okay, we're going to grab these fish out of the lake and we're going to take a look at them and we're going to give them little fish medication, you know, to help treat their tumors. We're going to cut their tumors off of them. We're going to release them back in the water. Uh, we're going to put some medication in there to, to try to, to help, help them deal with the challenges that they're dealing with. You know, where would that have gotten us? Instead, the way that we recovered the Great Lakes and we're starting to see them become healthy again, they run into challenges from now and then uh, with, you know, with uh, industrial waste and things like that still. But really what we did was we cleaned up the environment and then we let it go back to normal. Uh, nature knows what it needs to do to survive. Our bodies understand what it needs to survive. We just need to give it what it needs to, we need to give it the raw materials that it needs to, to thrive. You see, all sickness and disease really comes from failure to adapt to stress. And it can break it down even a little further. Either we're toxic and deficient, either we're toxic with things that our bodies don't need, or we're deficient in the things that our body does need. So the way to make our body stronger is to increase um, our sufficiency. We need to have sufficient vitamins, minerals, raw materials so that our body can build and repair damaged tissues, right? Um, so we need to have that sufficiency and we need to have it be uh, pure, uh, purity, uh, try to clean things out. And, and then we can end up here. So I want to introduce a new mindset for you. And that is the wellness mindset. This is a, a, a paradigm, right? We got to look at what, oh gosh, got dog coming in. I got kids playing the piano over here. So sorry about that, guys. Um, but what is what is wellness? So wellness really is, is a belief system. It's a it's a paradigm. And a paradigm is a lens through which we view the world, right? When we look at our reality, everybody's reality is slightly different because it's based upon everything we've ever encountered in terms of our past experiences, what we've learned um, over the years. So we we can have a great variety 
of, um, of reality when we talk from person to person to person, which one's right, which one's wrong. I'm not here to tell us which one's right or wrong. I'm here to try to figure out which one do you want in terms of a result, because there is a reality that you can create. But at the core concept of wellness is, is this idea of homeostasis and holism. The body works it up as a whole. You cannot have cardiovascular disease without it affecting something else in the body. Everything affects everything. This is why when folks start taking medication, they often have to take other medications to counteract the, the problems that were caused by the first medication that they take. But that's the whole idea. Homeostasis and holism is at the foundation of the wellness paradigm. Uh, the degree of health is simply equal to the degree of proper self-function. And then that, as a on the opposite of that, sickness really is just a lack of optimal cell function. So instead of taking, um, let, let me give you another example. I'll give you a little example like a plant, right? Plants are, are complex, very complex, but they basically need three things, right? They need good, healthy soil. That's where they're going to get their nutrition from, right? And then they need water and then they need sunlight. That's what a plant needs to be healthy. If you have a sick plant and you, and you give it more sunlight when what it needs is more nutrition, it's not going to get healthier, you see? So what we need to do is try to figure out what our body needs, use our symptoms to help understand what our body's trying to do, where the challenges are coming from. So I want to share with you what my core beliefs about health are, because when we look at this, our, our family, we do, things, we do things differently than most. Um, whether they're right or wrong, I'm not here to tell you that what we do is the best, what we do is right. Um, but I can tell you that our results have been pretty good. So what you're looking at here is my wife, myself, and my four boys. Now, when we look at the four boys there, um, you know, they for the most part, have never had any medications in their body, except for this little guy right here. So little Nolan was in the woods chopping down a tree uh, with my ax. Um, so don't call uh, social services on me. He's, he was well-trained, but he still shouldn't have done it. He needed to have my permission. But anyway, uh, when he was in the woods creating a path or a trail to ride his dirt bike and his uh, bicycle around in, um, I, I think that what happened was he ended up with a tick bite and got Lyme's disease. And it wrecked him pretty quick. And I was able to understand that this is something that we're, this is crisis intervention necessary. We need to go into the medical profession and try to figure out whether or not this is actually Lyme's. So he is the only one of our kids that has ever had a prescription medication. He's the only one that's ever really had a drug in his body would be Nolan and all of them are healthy. So we got now Blake is going to turn 14 and in, you know, tomorrow, actually, he's going to be 14. Um, at the time that we're recording this. And then uh, Ian is 12, Nolan is 10, Hawkin is, is seven. And, and, you know, we look at that result in terms of their level of health and we compare that to the general population. These kids are super healthy, okay? And the reason that they're super healthy, I believe is first of all, we're blessed without a doubt. We've been blessed to not run into giant challenges with them other than that, other than that bout of limes. Um, but also, you know, they're growing up in a family that has consciously identified core beliefs about our bodies and what is absolutely necessary for our bodies to be the strongest and most resilient that it can possibly be. And here is the breakdown of what that is. So the first the first concept is simply that the body is self-healing and self-regulating. When I was younger, I got to see this firsthand before I ever even knew chiropractic existed. Um, I was a very rough and tumble boy. Um, I had a lot of broken bones. Um, my parents uh, got turned into DHS because of it, <laughs> but really in reality, it wasn't their fault. I was just a rambunctious little guy that would go out there, you know, take my bicycle off of jumps, crash, 
um, flipping three wheelers. I had all, uh, you know, all sorts of injuries. And, you know, I, with my broken bones, I had to go into the doctor, right? I had to go in for that, that crisis intervention. And what they did was they casted my bone to make sure that it was lined up so that when the body went through its natural healing process, that that would heal as efficiently and as properly as possible. But in the end, the cast didn't heal anything. That healing happened from the inside. The same with the body being self-regulating. Um, I, I used to watch a lot of shows on Mount Everest. I don't know why I was just so fascinated by all these people that wanted to climb up into a zone that is known as the dead zone, meaning that the air is so thin that, that if you stayed up there too long, there was no chance for survival. Your body was getting weaker and weaker with every minute that you were up there. But these folks that were climbing this mountain, they would spend weeks and months at different levels, base camps within the mountains, because what happened is their self-regulating body would produce more red blood cells so that they could acclimate to the thinner air that was up there. So the body is self-regulating. Um, so we see this, my body's self-healing, self-regulating. The second core belief is that the nervous system, our nervous system, our brain and our nerves that run through our body and our senses, that is how we interpret our environment. And through this interpretation, the brain coordinates all the functions and activities that take place within our body to keep it in balance. Health is the normal state. Being healthy is the normal state. Okay. This is foundational for me to believe for us to live the lives that we've lived since, um, you know, since we've had kids even raising this family. So number three is simply stress can be overwhelming, okay? We're bombarded by it. We've talked about physical inactivity. Uh, we, we've talked about, well, not a whole lot, but we can talk, we're going to be talking about physical, chemical, and emotional stress and how stress in these categories can be overwhelming and cause things to kind of short circuit, right? The body's trying to protect itself. We call it maladaption, right? So what happens is, is that the body tries to set a new normal in an unfavorable environment and it can cause breakdown to, to occur within the body. Uh, now, what we also know is that when this stress overloads, something occurs, uh, a disturbance within the nervous system, almost like if you plugged all of your appliances into one outlet in your kitchen and you tried running them at once, you would trip a breaker. OK, that is equivalent to stress overwhelm on that electrical circuit. Now, if we were in, the, in medicine, what we would do is we would start looking at, uh, you know, if we looked at the appliance itself, maybe we'd start tearing it apart, trying to figure out where the motor's broken. Right. Um, instead of maybe seeing what eventually what initially caused that. So but what happened was is you blew a breaker. Right. So in the body, when you blow a breaker, we see that show up as as abnormal patterns of tension and tightness within the neuromuscular system. OK, the neuromuscular system is tied in and is one within the nervous system in the brain. That's the holistic well, action of it. We call this word a subluxation. Chiropractors, my chiropractor is the one that corrects these subluxations. Thank you, Dr. Jenny. I give you a lots of opportunity uh, with the way that I live to correct my subluxations caused by me still being rough and tumble and thinking that I'm a kid. So I do appreciate, uh, appreciate all of that. But my chiropractor corrects these subluxations. What that does is it helps the brain break that pattern and allow for something different to happen allow for your body to adapt in a different way than what it has in the past okay so that leads to the next one the healthy lifestyle the way we eat move and think that's what allows us to be stronger and more resilient when we get this right okay not all stress is bad you know lifting weights for instance is stressing the muscle you're creating a lot of breakdown but if your body is in a healthy state of recovery as it builds back stronger tissue you end up stronger on the back end of it that is what resilience looks like that's what strength looks like um, and then one of the last ones and this is 
this is one of the hardest ones for new people that are trying to take on this wellness paradigm. This is one of the hardest things for them to understand. And that is how I feel is not necessarily a good indicator of how healthy I am. Okay. We all know somebody. We've all had someone in our lives that was feeling good, um, living life, had no ideas there's anything wrong with them, go in for a routine screening and find out they have cancer. Okay. Now, what we know is that cancer did not develop overnight, right? Same thing with cardiovascular issues, high blood pressure. Most of the people initially, it takes a while before they realize that they have a problem. Now, on the flip side of this, if you're constantly not feeling well, then I think it's worth investigation to try to figure out why you're not feeling well, but it's not necessarily a good indication of how healthy you are. I'll give you another example. Um, if you were, you know, let's say, let's say you went out to eat and somehow you ended up getting in contact with some, with some food that's tainted with like E. coli bacteria, for instance. Okay. Now we have a ton of E. coli that's already living in our bodies. Right. Uh, and it doesn't cause any problems, but let's say you get, you get this food poisoning. How, and, and, and then once you get food poisoning, what happens? Your body tries getting it out. So we deal with diarrhea. We deal with vomiting. It's coming out of everywhere. You don't know whether you need to sit, stand, a toilet, or a garbage can. Uh, maybe sometimes you need both and you feel absolutely awful. But is your body in that moment, is your body actually unhealthy? Or is it doing exactly what it needs to be doing to make you healthy? I'm going to argue that it's doing exactly what it needs to be doing to make you healthy. Now, if you don't change uh, some behaviors following a big bout of food poisoning, for instance, if you're not taking in a lot of extra fluids then you get dehydrated and then you go, then you get into a situation where your body is in bad shape, right? But in the end, what gets you better? Getting hydrated right? So how you feel is not a good indicator of how healthy you are. Okay. We look at like, let's say just in our aging population, the aches and pains that come along with aging, you know, some people they hurt and they're inactive and there's other people who hurt and they're active, which ones are healthier, even though they're hurting, right? So we got to choose our path of suffering sometimes. And going off of pain alone is not going to get you where you want to be, okay? So that's at the core of my beliefs. Now, I've spent a lot of time on this triangle. Let's see, I got one more. No, I got. So I've spent a lot of time on this triangle trying to figure this out. In fact, we took our whole office staff last January through a, health, a, a life book experience where we looked at 12 different categories of our life to bring consciousness into these different categories. And one of those categories was health and fitness. So the, what I did, we went through a discovery process to understand our premise or our core beliefs about health and fitness. Uh, I had put some notes in here, small daily choices play the biggest role in my overall health. Creating su successful habits is the key to my health and fitness. And then my body is designed by God to be healthy. This is at the core. Healthy is the normal state if you're doing things right. Okay. Healthy is the normal state. Now, remember what I said, things happen, things happen. And when things happen to you, chances are, if you live long enough, things are going to happen. And if things happen to you when you're sick, you're not going to have as good of an outcome as when things happen to you when you're healthy. So we really, really got to focus on this stuff. So what's your objective? What do you want to happen this year with your health? You know, the Bible says in many different places, you reap what you sow. That can be in positive light. That can be in negative light. If you are sowing, if you are planting the seeds of health a little bit every single day, your body will get healthier. It just works that way. It's, it's that, that's the natural state. And, and we need to understand that, that that's the natural state. So are you simply looking to avoid disease? 
Okay. Are you looking to lose weight? Are you looking to just get ripped, get big, strong muscles? There's different behaviors and patterns that lead to getting these types of results. Um, or do you just want to create optimal health? You know, it's up to you. Uh, Dr. Jenny and I, we are here to help you on this journey. I know that you guys have, at least ones that have come in the office, I know you've filled out these like stress surveys and goal sheets for scan days and things like that. And, and, and we do that to try to bring consciousness, to, to help you bring consciousness to your health, to your beliefs, so that your beliefs can, can create healthier behaviors and actions, which in the end are going to give you results that allow you to live the life that you really truly want to live. So two weeks from now, we're going to do this all over again. We're going to focus on one category of stress, the chemical category in our eat well workshop. So um, hope you all make it then. And we will talk to you soon. And I'm going to end this thing. I want to thank you for joining. And for those of you that um, I don't know if this is live streaming on Facebook or not, but um, if not, it will be posted. So you can find us there, everybody. Have a great uh, rest of your morning and uh, we'll catch you all later. Bye.